Tonight, um, the uh, panel discussion will be led by Professor jo Joanne Savio, who taught film uh, in the department, in the film department at uh, NYU, New York, for 16 years before she came here to NYU Abu Dhabi in 2010. And she now teaches in the visual arts and film program and new media program here at our campus. She's a photographer herself, specializing in portraits and in dance, representation thereof uh, in photography. Um, both are very, very important themes in her work. And um, the sessions that she had with very famous people will illustrate um, in a way how important her work is because through her work, these artists also became rather well known. If I mention to you Robert Rauschenberg, Trisha Brown, Merce Cunningham, Michael Bar Baryshnikov, Bilti Jones, and Pina Bausch. They have all been portrayed by Joan Savio. And her book, Vital Grace, explores the world now of African-American male dancers and the cultural difficulties they encountered in choosing movement as a profession. There again, the interconnection between art and life. Joan Savio's work has been exhibited in Europe and the United States. Her portrait and dance work is included in numerous book collections, including Dance and Art and Dialogue, Life's Publication, the Year in Pictures, and The Fine Contemporary Art, which was published in 2012. She's currently working on a mixed media project with her husband and writer, Professor Jim Savio, titled Homesick, a meditation on the complexity of home and family in a transnational landscape. She is actually the first from her family uh, in over 100 years uh, who returned to the Middle East uh, and journey back to where her family came from uh, in Lebanon. And we are very glad that she will introduce tonight uh, two marvelous artists and who will talk under the guidance of Joanne about their work and their life. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome you. Thank you, Reindert. Um, I also want to welcome everyone, ask you to please put your cell phones, turn them off if you will. And I also want to just take a moment to thank the Institute, as well as our Dean of Arts and Humanities, Judith Miller, and the Writing Department for really their support in bringing the artists Suko and Zaina El Khalil here with us tonight. Um, they went, they helped with every detail of this event, right down to the vegan reception afterward, in respect to both of our artists. Two years ago, I took my Introduction to Visual Culture class to Lebanon. And we spent an entire day and evening with Zaina. She shared her art, her, food, her life, her food, and her culture with us. My husband, Jim Savio, met Sue Co in New York about three years ago and approached her then with the idea to visit our campus. We're both passionate admirers, admirers of their work and their lives. In many ways, they serve as mentors to us both. Last night, over 100 colleagues and students met with the artists and talked about their art and their activism. Both artists are giving individual workshops to our students this week. Tonight we'll listen, we'll look carefully, and discuss the subject, the life we live and the art we make. Perhaps this evening we'll hold a mirror to our own lives. What events, what memories, what loss, and what joy brings us to where we find ourselves now. As diverse as their palettes may seem, I think the intentions behind their respective work are quite unified in their hearts, or so it seems to me. We're going to start with Zaina's work. She's based in Beirut, Lebanon. She works in a range of styles and genres, including painting, installation, performance, mixed media, collage, and writing. Her work looks to create bridges between cultures and religion. Central to her art are the themes of war, violence, gender, and reconciliation. Her materials are found objects, textiles, and a variety of popular cultural artifacts. Al Khalil became a TED Fellow in 2012 and is currently in production on a film based on her published memoir, Beirut, I Love You. I welcome you both to Abu Dhabi. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, I come from a part of the world that's often associated to 
violence and hostility. But despite all that, I decided at a very young age that I wanted love to guide my path in this life. I grew up between Lagos, Nigeria and Beirut, Lebanon. Um, as a child, I was always very conscious about what I had and what others didn't. That traumatic ride to school every morning in my air-conditioned car as we passed by children on the street, malnutrition, begging for money, that experience encouraged me to want to stand up for those who didn't have a voice. As I moved to England for high school, um, I found that I was in a very different kind of environment, a stark contrast to Africa. I went to my first Iron Maiden concert, <laughs> very different to the Fela Kuti I grew up listening to. Um, so the trauma I experienced in the UK was very different. It was the trauma of the excess, those who have too much. Um, when I turned 18, I decided it was time to go to Lebanon in search of my roots. Um, but what I found there was a society that was divided, brutalized, and honestly very broken. I found myself in a hard place again, not really knowing where I belong. Um, however, after a few years, um, I realized that I had developed a special gift. Um, I think that what defined me the most was popular culture. And uh, little did I know then that it would help me develop um, a complex but beautiful language, that of the East and the West. This important bridge would later steer the visual evolution of my world and help me create my own personal vision of Beirut. Most of my work is reactionary to where I live. Um, and through my art, I'm trying to create bridges between cultures and religions. I see my work as a byproduct of political and economic turmoil, focusing on issues of violence, gender, and religion and their place in our bubblegum culture. I try to expose the superficiality of war, creating an alternate reality. And my weapons of choice are love and humor. Consumerism and war, they are one and the same. The plastic I use in my paintings are made from oil, the same oil that mankind is at war for. The markets of Lagos encouraged me to look to the streets for inspiration and solutions. I use materials of everyday life in Beirut, everything from kafiyas to plastic toys, artificial flowers, um, glittery fabric, you name it. But in my version of Beirut, I see things a little differently. I see large paintings of martyred suicide bombers next to shops selling super sexy lingerie, next to billboards advertising beer, next to you know, the latest vendor selling the latest pirated Lady Gaga CDs, next to cops carrying Kalashnikovs who always seem to be bumping into me. I just don't get it. I seem to attract guns. It's very easy to assume certain things about my work when you see all the glitter and beads. Um, but I found that in order to paint and write about violence, I've had to create my own language. I want my work to be accessible because peace should be completely accessible. I don't use glue in my work. Um, I use pins, thousands and thousands of tiny pins. Um, it's a long process, but it puts me into a state of meditation and is helping me climb my spiritual ladder. In a way, the pins in the work reflect the instability of my region. At any point in time, you could rearrange my paintings to tell a completely different story, not so different from our Lebanese political uh, stuff. Uh, OK, I'm going to behave tonight. So I use the color pink a lot. Um, pink is like cotton candy. It's fluffy and sweet. 
but too much of it will leave a bad pain in your stomach. It's quick, superficial. Barbie, G.I. Joe politics, and Cherry Cola to me represent a generation that grew up pink. My generation is completely embedded in consumer culture. But other than shopping and MTV, there is a beautiful and powerful side to pink. It's the color of nonviolent protest. I convert an object of violence into a celebration of life through a transformation into something beautiful. I truly believe that humor is a strong tool to break down walls. And love, love is the foundation that will build our bridges. This is an ongoing body of work called Goods for Gaza. As most of you may know, there's a blockade on Gaza by the Israeli army, land, air, and sea. The army has a list of items that are banned from Gaza. And after uh, several activists were killed on board the Mavi Marmara in uh, 2010, as they were trying to bring in um, much needed aid and supplies into Gaza, um, I started wondering, well, what's on this list? How scary could it be? Um, the truth is that the, the list contains more or less 2,000 items, which include the following. A4 paper, goats, biscuits, donkeys, goats, ginger. I want to ask you a question tonight. Who here believes that Palestinian children have the right to eat chocolate? I've been making a mixed media painting for each word and will continue to do so until the blockade ends. Palestinian children should have the right to eat chocolate. In Lebanon, back to Lebanon, life is so uncertain and we tend to live each day as if there was no tomorrow. Everything is so intense. We work like there's no tomorrow. We argue, drink, drive, and sadly, even make love as if it were our last day on Earth. Um, Beirut is a complex but beautiful and passionate city. When you're constantly courting death, you, you learn how to appreciate life. Um, you learn how to improvise dinners over candlelight. Why? Well, they just took the electricity away again. Um, you grow flowers, lots of flowers, jasmine, gardenia, all over your balcony to cover up the bullet holes on the side of your buildings. You become naturally creative because absolutely nothing is certain and no day is ever like the previous one. However, on the downside, we've become so immune to even the possibility of any stability that we've stopped planning for the future. And that scares me. I live in a world of chaos where dream and reality collide. I don't sleep well at night. It's hard to find security, so I have to create my own. Glitter reflects light, and the more color and glitter I use, the closer I am to light, to the source. The pink objects and embellishments are my positive energy. I take aim and shoot them into the heart of fear, negating the negative. Here's a giant rotating sculpture I built. It's four meters by four meters, and yes, it says Allah. It's covered by tiny, tiny mirrors. Music accompanies this, and you are invited to dance rather than kill under the light of God. The problems with living in a post-war city are many. Nothing works the way it should, not even the people. We live under the constant threat that at any time things could flare up again. We live under the humiliation of all the horrible things we once did to each other. And today, we stand side by side in lines waiting to get into nightclubs. Yeah, we dance a lot in Beirut. Dancing, it seems, has become a form of healing. It helps us to forget why we turned against each other, why we found each other so different. This sculpture is an invitation to forget about what tears us apart and remember about what brings us together, to attempt forgiveness. 
This is a propaganda flyer dropped on me, us, Lebanon, um, by the Israeli army during their invasion in 2006. I remember collecting them as they fell from the sky, millions and millions of tiny little pink papers, pink papers just for me. I was so intrigued. They were pink. Must have been for me. Um, so I think you guys know who, who, who these people are. Um, and uh, this is what it later became, a celebration of life. Its original purpose of instigating fear and division totally transformed. Something along the lines of Manet's luncheon on the grass meets Kubrick's full metal jacket <laughs> on acid. <laughs> Today, poets have become a rare species. And in Beirut, war and politics are always on the forefront. There is little support or funding for the arts. And free thinkers are often put down, threatened, and sometimes even killed. But. I am an army of pink, so bring it on. These little soldiers that I make, I spread around the world. They're my army of love, and they've been spotted everywhere from New York to New Delhi, trying to spread message of peace. OK, let's go back a little. How did this all start? On September 11, 2001, I was standing in the middle of Sixth Avenue. And as I watched the first building fall, I knew the world would never be the same again. It was very difficult being an Arab in New York after that. Two years later, I watched the US invade Iraq with their shock and awe mission. I watched it from my tiny TV in my Brooklyn studio. I was alone, angry, and there was nothing, nothing I could do to stop all these senseless deaths that were about to happen. That night, I stretched up a canvas and painted this portrait. I thought about how Iraq was going to become divided and occupied like Palestine. This was the night that my artwork changed, and I decided to devote myself completely to making art that would raise awareness on war, art that might help make a difference to our society. I eventually moved back to Beirut, but what I was about to witness and experience, no one could prepare me for. Assassinations, car bombs, and the full-scale invasion of Lebanon by the Israeli army in 2006. The first night the bombs fell, I pulled out my computer and started writing. If I was going to die that night, I wanted to make sure the whole world knew how and why. I did not want to be another nameless war victim. I was also writing about my best friend in the whole wide world, my soulmate, Maya, who at the time had recently been diagnosed with cancer. We literally found ourselves dodging bombs, trying to get her to hospital for chemotherapy. I wrote every day, yes, just like Shahrazad, believing that maybe sharing our stories could help keep us alive. I remember writing about um, a tin of milk that Maya and I had picked up at the supermarket. We put it back thinking that it might be of more use to a mother, and instead we bought a bottle of triple sec to make cosmopolitans. Maya was a huge Sex in the City fan. I also wrote about um, the environmental disasters. The Israeli army blew up our fuel reserves, and 15,000 tons of oil spilled into our beautiful Mediterranean Sea. It was the worst environmental disaster of the Eastern Mediterranean. But I wrote with love in my heart, because I truly believed that if I could make a real human connection with my readers, then maybe they would genuinely feel you know, that motivated to, to try and do something to help us. Um, Maya's condition touched their hearts. And gradually, they began protesting to their governments, demanding ceasefire on our behalf. I had no idea back then how important blogging was to become to the Arab world. 
On the day of ceasefire, I still believed that Maya and I would grow old together. We had gotten through the worst of it. But I was wrong. War is cancer, and cancer is war. And Maya never had a fair fight. We lost her, and then I lost myself. There was a long period of darkness, a year of my life I don't remember. But in that darkness, I started writing again. Writing healed me, and love kept me alive. Two years later, Beirut, I Love You, a memoir was born. It has since been translated into several languages and is in the process of becoming a feature film. I strongly believe that our region can change for the better. And I believe that education, art, and literature can help bring about positive changes. I love working alone in the studio late at night as the sun begins to rise. It's the most beautiful feeling. But I also love being part of a growing community. And I think that we're living in a very special time now as Arabs. Our part of the world is changing by the second. I also believe that if you really want to make a change in your society, <laughs> let's go, you have to walk the talk. Um, this is a dress that I wear every year and run around the streets of Beirut in. I call her the Pink Bride of Peace. I have passed out flowers and hugs to hundreds and hundreds of people, and even some kisses every now and then, all in the name of love. This year was my 10-year anniversary, and I'm not really sure if it's working, but the fact that I can still fit into this dress after 10 years, <laughs> come on, it says something. What if we were all pink brides of peace? What if we stormed our government buildings demanding that they write love into our constitution? Just to conclude, I believe that love is the most powerful tool we have. Love is what will change the world. Love is what will transform the Middle East. Nothing else has worked so far. All we have left after so much loss and devastation, all we have left is love. It is the only way that walls will fall and bombs and bullets will cease to exist. If violence begets violence, love can only bring love. I would like to conclude by showing a very short video. It's a book trailer um, to the book. And I think this will give you a better idea of the kind of world I live in. Thank you. I told you, a woman never dies in a wedding dress. There is a thin line between reality and dream. The period after the Lebanese Civil War was one of hope and change. I did not see the rebirth, however. I could only see the scars. Beirut homes and buildings riddled with bullet holes. Electricity wires that crisscrossed the city, pirated cable. The cloud of hashish that covered the sky, traffic. Traffic. People began to rebuild their lives. The war was being erased. Plastic and glass were in. Silicon replaced reality. In La Vie en Rose, our people were drowning. Just like their buildings, they were becoming sexy and alluring on the outside, but hollow and empty on the inside. People were so humiliated and broken from the war that the only thing they could do was to forget. And there were at least a million and one ways to be able to forget in Lebanon. They smoked and drank and snorted everything they could find. We wrote poetry. We jumped over fences into abandoned buildings and drank vodka under the stars. We parked on the corniche and made out. Love and sex and drugs and alcohol were our new law and order.
In so many ways, the war never really ended. Our neighbors continued to drop bombs on us. In the year 2000, the Israeli army withdrew after having occupied the south of Lebanon for 22 years. Because of the occupation, until the year 2000, I had gone through my entire life without ever having visited the village of my ancestors, Hasbaya. What they don't tell you about bombs is how loud they are. Your whole house shakes. The windows rattle. The electricity may suddenly go off. You hear your neighbors screaming somewhere down the street. You lose people you love. I have a fever. I'm not sure how long I've been like this, and no one knows for sure what caused it. My mother sits beside my bed. She's trying to find God so that she may ask him to let me live. I have a fever. I'm jumping on top of the couch. I start singing from the top of my lungs. I'm hallucinating. It is an incredible rush. I'm sick, but I don't feel sick. I've beat death so many times. I have a fever. This time, I want it to last. His body is grinding up against mine. Our hips are joined. We're dancing in circles. In Beirut, I am delirious. I'm so far away from death. I cannot help but feel that I am part of something much greater than this whore we call Beirut. The years from now, someone may not even be able to find Beirut on the map. She will be the lost city of Atlantis. She has built herself seven times, but how long can this charade go on? One day, it's all going to end, and when it does, it will be beautiful. I will walk down to the beach. Maya will already be there, waiting for me. The two of us will sit down and watch the last sunset. We will walk into the water, and I will not be afraid. Anything is better than war, even death. Beirut is too big to wear a wedding dress. She cannot live forever. Beirut, I love you. I told you. She was a social and political activist devoted to the cause of human rights and animal justice. Co considers herself a graphic witness, recording what's hidden and what people are indifferent to. Working mostly in illustration and printmaking, she's published eight books, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, Time Magazine, and The New Yorker. The subject of several short documentaries, her art has been shown in over 100 exhibitions internationally. Sue will be selling prints after our talk, of which 100% of the profit will go to the local animal shelter in Abu Dhabi. And I hope you enjoy her work. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for coming to our talk. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, to begin, uh, at the beginning, this was, I was raised next to a slaughterhouse. It was a large, um, predominantly hog slaughterhouse. And then at the back of our house was a factory farm. So growing up was just a barrel of laughs <laughs> with two parents that should have been on medication and eventually separated, making for a better life. Um, and this is when a hog escaped, a pig escaped from the slaughterhouse. And I'm standing just outside with my mother and I realize not is well in this world. Not all is well. And people were standing around laughing, and the pig went through a busy road, intersection and traffic. 
being chased by men in bloodied overalls. And I asked my mother why this was funny, as the pigs circled the war memorial of the latest war and then rushed into the street. And she said, it's not funny. So I saw the most people standing around laughing. And it wasn't. I didn't get the funny part. And let's go to the next. And then I figured out we don't want to see what's on the other side of the wall. A part of our human mechanism is not wanting to look into the sun all day. You know, because the truth is like the sun. You just don't want to keep looking at it. And how we can be so content as long as that wall is there. And so I decided, you know, when I was a little kid, to go into the slaughterhouse, so I was 10, and I always wanted to be an artist. I knew that was the only thing I wanted to be. And luckily, that's worked out well. You know, I've been all over the world, and I haven't earned any money or anything, but I've never wanted. So isn't that strange? I've never bothered about money, and it just comes in little trivial little bits, just enough for the next day. And so this is me as a kid drawing in the slaughterhouse. And I try and go to a slaughterhouse wherever I go because this is happening continuously. It's billions of animals being slaughtered and the war is on all life. It's a continuous war on all life. So this morning we got into a slaughterhouse in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi, which I'll tell you about later. But this is a large animal slaughterhouse. It's a captive bolt pistol he's using. This is a slaughterhouse um, in Queens, New York, that was closed because a cow named Queenie escaped. And the police called her a bull and chased her down with guns because they couldn't. You know, any time a cow escapes a slaughterhouse, it has to be male gender, as told by the authorities. And it's usually a female. Um, but it doesn't matter because guns are used and it justifies the use of guns. Anyway, a hairdresser ran out of a hair salon and said, don't shoot that cow. I have a lariat. I mean, this is Queens, New York. Like, who has lariats in hairdressers? So they didn't. Queenie was rescued. And then they closed this slaughterhouse for a week in 100 degrees in the summer with animals inside because it was a health violation. So then we called the slaughterhouse and said, have you got any animals in the slaughterhouse? And he said, yes, I can't go in there because it's been closed. And we said, is there water in there? And he goes, no, there's no water in there. I can't go in there. And so we said, can we take the animals then? And so we drove, and he said he'd pray to the prophet to see if we could that night. Then we called him the next day. The prophet said we could. So we went, drove down there, and there are about 100 animals that were still alive. So it's not true. You can't go without water for a week. And they'd stayed alive on the mounds of bodies. And that's me. That was the only one I actually picked up because mostly I was just moving them out to the truck. And it was a goose. And she stayed alive on the pyramid. And I felt her heart beat. And she was as thin as a piece of paper. And I thought, she stayed alive in that place. The door, when we opened that door, it was so bright that when I first walked in the slaughterhouse, I could not see. You know how it is when you go from extreme sunlight? And uh, she stayed alive just so we could get her. And she's just a simple goose. And her best friend today is a chicken because that chicken was on top of the slaughter pile, on top of the dead pile. Each animal I've drawn, I try to think of them as unique individual beings. So, you know, when you've seen so much slaughter, it's, you have to keep reminding yourself the only reason I'm in this slaughterhouse is to remind you of this animal. And she has a number stamped in her ear. This is a tiny drawing, it's eight inches, it's factory farm. 
And all the animals went insane because all the animals are insane in the meat industrial complex in America. It is intensive farming. So the word farm doesn't really come to mind, but the, you know, you'll have cows in a concrete pen and you'll have 40,000 cows, a finishing pen. And that's to put the weight on. So all these animals have got straight jackets. And how I get in slaughterhouses, they say, you're not an animal rights activist, are you? And I say, I'm English. <laughs> that works. <laughs> um, this is for Mexico. Mexico's now rising above the United States in meat consumption, the same with uh, China. It's a new middle class that wants a lot of meat. Um, this says, modern man pursued by the ghosts of his meat. And I saw McDonald's. That was the first thing I noticed when I arrived here. Um, this is commercial work. I never dreamed I could be an artist, ever. When I went to art school, they said, oh, you're a female, you'll do children's books. I don't know any children. I never would choose to be around children. I have no interest in breeding any. And I was stuck in this art school that made me a children's book illustrator. <laughs> it was a disaster. So when I took my portfolio of children's book ideas to publishers, they said, this looks like Nazi Germany. You're <laughs> never, ever going to get any work. <laughs> and it was sad. So then I moved over to the New York Times and I said, I'm, a, I'm an ex-children's book writer <laughs> and <laughs> use my work. And they said, maybe. Well, I had $100 and so I waited in the office. That's all I had, $100, which was enough for two hotel nights. And they said, well, we'll give you a job maybe. Come back next week. And I said, well, I actually, I'm here. I can just wait for the job. So that was at nine o'clock. And at nine o'clock at night, she said, take this manuscript then. And I went, oh, good, manuscript. And I went back to the hotel room, knocked something out, brought it back, they published it, that was that. Um, so that's all that sort of work. As long as you bring it in at the last minute, they can't censor it. <laughs> you know, because it's all overnight work. They give it to you on the telephone. They say, this is something, 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 and that writer hasn't even come up with a manuscript, but I think it's going to be about this. And then you bring it back in, then they print it, and it's too late to get another artist. But you know what's happening with art directors there now? Artist art directors. You know what that means? It means as soon as they censor, censor you and dump you, they then do their own crappy artwork and stick it in the place. Of, that's a, on a happy thought. That's a... Um, <laughs> That's the birthday party of Nelson Mandela. It's the biggest birthday party in the world and went all over on um, television. And it was mostly Bono and it was, it was very good. And we all did posters for it. And uh, many artists are dead, a lot of African artists. And Keith Haring died of HIV. And it was lovely. He's just... This was for Entertainment Weekly and they said, do something on the Gulf War, but don't make it political. <laughs> there are certain restrictions one has in commercial art because they don't want anything to make you disturbed with the ads, you know, because it could be like someone selling jets or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on the next page. So that's important. Um, this was a touch of irony. I mean, I do figurative art and I only use a pencil and I've got a sketchbook and I do it quickly. So it's not, you don't need Photoshop. It's like reportage. It's like being, you just need a pencil stub and a piece of paper. That's it. And you can record things. That was nearly overnight. That was, they said, do every character of Star Trek. And I said, you know, and they never watch TV because they're too important. You know, they don't know anything about culture and they ask you to do the impossible. Like, I know how many characters there are in every Star Trek. There's like 400. 
<laughs> so how do you do that overnight? So that's the game sort of Trixilia and that's Spock and Gene Roddenberry going through Garden Gates forever. And I asked him where the gays were in the 24th century because when I was really poor and I got to New York City, I used to go to the Star Trek conventions, which is like where you meet radical lesbian feminists. <laughs> um, for some reason, they like dressing up as Spock with having ears or Klingons. It, you know, it's America. You'll never meet political people except at comic cons. You understand <laughs> that? So anyway, I did it. And then I met Spock at a, a thing at someone's party. I met him and he looks like Spock and he talked like Spock. And the most radical thing was he was married to a woman nearly his own age. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big billboard for this Museum of Modern Art in Massachusetts that only has abstract crap. I always say this, this is old. They might have better art now, but when I did this, it was abstract crap. And they get all figurative artists to go on the billboard because it's a high concept idea where you go down the highway. Oh, there's Barbara Krieger. Oh, there's Leon Golub. Oh, there's who's she? That's me, Suko. <laughs> right, oh, there we go. And then you're in the museum with the abstract crap. This is how they think, how to get people in the museum. Well, you don't get it by showing abstract crap on billboards. Anyway, that was censored because it turns out the billboard guy was McDonald's. So I said, what do you mean it's not on the highway? And he said, well, you know, I said, well, where is my billboard? And he said, it's in the car park. And I said, well, where is the car park? Where's the map for the car park? He said, it's behind the building. So it wasn't even, that's the story of my whole life. I don't even get sense of where it's glamorous. <laughs> I just get stuck in some car park where no cars are. <laughs> this is, uh, the crime is economics. I don't believe people are evil or stupid. I believe that um, mostly sweet natured will go with the flow like sheep but I'm, I love sheep and I hang around with sheep I'm not saying that as a derogatory I'm saying we're top predators now and we're actually sheep it's a big mistake whoever planned this take it back because we're sheep with guns now sheep don't do guns well wolves do guns well they do top predator well they can deal they can deal with guns metaphor pass it this is not working for us. <laughs> so we had a great trip this morning. I got total access to the slaughterhouse, which is unbelievable. It was complete transmar transparency. I thought he was going to do a bit of a switcheroo, and he didn't. Dr. Rafe, who's the chief veterinarian at the slaughterhouse in the port, he was open. It was transparent. That would never happen ever in America, and never, I can't tell you. And I noticed so many things. It was, it was, um, um, it was really good. I mean, he answered every question. I could draw, we could take photos. And I noticed that one of the cruelties of slaughterhouses is the handling when the animals go in, which usually it's a cattle prob, which is an electric device. They push it in the animal's eye to get them to move into the slaughterhouse or out of the truck. You know how they move them in Ab Abu Dhabi? They move them by hand. Can you believe that? I couldn't believe it. This is the real 99%. You know, this was during Occupy, and they, Occupy Wall Street, and they liked this, actually. No one was offended by this. Um, we're in the fourth biggest extinction now. You know, mammals go extinct, and we're going extinct. So, yeah, that uh, says it all, really, the 150 billion sentient beings that are slaughtered for food we don't need that's actually killing us. I mean, no, uh, the human species is not meant to consume this amount of animal fat. So the the onset, child onset diabetes, obesity, are all hitting here, where we live here. Um, this is the second biggest meat consumer in the region after Saudi. Uh, this is gas chambers. Now all hogs in the United States will be gassed. 
Um, the reason for this, you might ask, it's, they call it humane. And I'm interested in the concept of splitting, how a human being can say, well, gassing human beings is the worst evil one can possibly do, but gassing another species is the most humane thing one can possibly do. Now, you figure out the logic of that. Um, the reason they're doing this is it's faster and they can get rid of labor. So the hogs will, the pigs will go in six at a time. They take up to a minute and a half to die. Um, they can take up to a minute and a half to die. And the hogs will climb these walls to get out of um, choking, you know? Um, and they're showered first in extreme freezing cold so they can be all night covered with ice. Um, decompression, poultry are decompressed now. This is the quickest way to slaughter poultry. Not individually. Now birds, any birds, have um, very delicate eardrums which burst. And again, it's no labor. The meat industrial complex wants, don't want to pay any human beings. This is cheaper. And this is us. You know, we are complicit in this, we're complicit, and we remove ourselves from the slaughterhouse floor. I mean, the guys we met today, they're there. You know, there's a dignity in being there. There's not a dignity in consuming something that's so distant, so packaged in cellophane packets, all neatly in the supermarket and tinted red, tinted pink. Um, we can avoid doing this. We don't need to do this. It's the number one cause of climate change is the meat industry, which is linked to fossil fuel and pharmaceuticals. You understand you can't have a million animals together unless they're medicated. It's so pandemics are spreading like wildfire. This was on a print, a plate I did outside of a slaughterhouse. Well, I was inside the slaughterhouse, and this truck had come 350 miles. The animals hadn't had any water. They dropped on their knees and drank the blood of the animals that had just been slaughtered before them. That's how thirsty they were. Uh, this is slaughterhouse in Newark. Um, the people of Newark don't want slaughterhouses because the flies are everywhere and they go over the children. They don't want factory farming. Um, these slaughterhouses are on regular blocks. You barely notice them. Um, and in these slaughterhouses, it's as though I'm saying to you, I'm going to slaughter you all. And I can, I can very easily. Um, and you would get these walls and you would make yourselves invisible from me. And I would still come and get you all. And you know, what they were saying this morning at the slaughterhouse is the numbers, like he can do 150, 250 in a morning. That's a regular, typical uh, load of animals. And uh, this is a slaughterhouse in Pennsylvania. This is, she has a broken back or leg. She's in the restraining pen. Again, this morning I saw a different restraining pen that I have never seen before. I've only seen this in books. This is incredibly cruel because the animals are watching another animal being slaughtered and they're the same herd. So they feel great anxiousness. Um, and she's not been milked and every time she fell, the milk's coming out of her udders and mingling with the blood on the kill floor. And this is an incredibly dangerous job because unlike this morning, these cows are struggling and they're swinging and hitting. Um, they're very heavy and their faces are being cut off whilst they're alive because the trick is to exsanguinate all the blood. But this morning I saw something. They have a cylinder the cow walks in the cylinder, is gently rotated, the throat's exposed, cut. There is no captive bolt pistol, it's hell hell. And the animal slowly exsanguinates. So the whole pulling out of the back leg and hanging upside down is completely removed in this. And then Dr. Rafe said they're gonna actually play music. Because in this situation, you know, with goats and sheep, they will be screaming. They play loud, heavy metal rock, so the workers don't get disturbed. And Doctor, this was almost silent in this slaughterhouse this morning. He said, we're going to have music. So he said about noise pollution, and this was everything I've thought about, 
anyway, I don't want to go on about it, but this is a slaughterhouse in Canada and he's lost all his fingers. This is a veal skinner and um, they do 1,500 cuts an hour. And it was only after I'd been drawing him all day that I noticed he has no fingers because the knives are so sharp. All those veals go to New York City restaurants. Um, this is transport in extreme heat. Uh, poultry is not covered under any humane slaughter law in America. So it's done in the cheapest way, which in this case is bludgeoning sick, sick turkeys to death. Fish, I've never done fish before, and now I'm starting to be interested in fish because our oceans are emptying. The number one consumer of fish is who? Does anyone know? It's not human. It's the factory farmed pig. So oceans are being emptied to feed factory farmed them billions of pigs. And these fishes are alive on the block and they're chosen. This is in San Francisco. And they've got beautiful colored scales and they come from the Galapagos. They've been poached. And this fish flipped herself onto the ground. And once they're flipped onto the ground, all the scales now get covered with cigarette butts and dust, and they lose the color, and they're slowly suffocating. Uh, this is thinning, which now certain countries are not allowing. The reason this is happening is it's so much money involved. And this is the hammerhead shark, which has more fins. That's why it's a number one choice. And they throw back the sharks who drown. They won't last very long. Just for the fin, just for erectile dysfunction, which is a myth. Try Viagra, I beg of you. Don't eat fins. So they slowly drown and um, it's a billion dollar year business. If you look at the tops of roofs of buildings, you'll see a billion fins. And again, it's a cultural lie. It's meaningless and we're emptying our oceans for a lie. <laughs> Just unbelievable. What can you say? <laughs> um, this was a fundraiser for Sea Shepherd. Um, these beautiful creatures, again, oy. that's a fundraiser outside. That would be an investment piece. And money will go to the animal shelter. Yes, you could get it as a present. It's not expensive. This is a one-time only price. Don't come after me again. This is the end. <laughs> Um, this is for children, go vegan and nobody gets hurt. Because so many children now all over the world are vegan. It's so positive. You know, I'm meeting baby vegans. I mean, I've eaten more meat than any of you guys. And now I'm eat meeting baby vegans that have never even touched flesh. So anywhere you go in the world, like I met Zaina, and she's a vegetarian. I meet artists and vegetarians, and that's where you're peaceful. You can go to any country in the world and you go, where's the animal rights activists? Where's the artists? And they'll take you and then all oh, you're safe. It's good. It's happy. Thank you. In a little while, I'll open up to the audience questions that you, I'm sure you'll have to ask the artists. But I just wanted to ask you a couple of things before we begin. Is the, is the intention behind your art, both of your art, to create change? Oh, and does it? <laughs> Do you think it does create change? Zaina created change for me. She went in that market and she started to negotiate like I have never seen. <laughs> she whipped out her hands and said, look, this is ringless. <laughs> we need a good price on this. And I just couldn't even, I was just wanting to buy a little handkerchief thing. She got it down from 150 thingies to 50. <laughs> like the hand whipped up. We were like two women that needed a man. I mean, it was so <laughs> humiliating. And it was just 
And it went on so long. <laughs> that was a change, <laughs> a change I felt. <laughs> that, that was nothing. I'll take you to Lagos and we'll do real bargaining <laughs> room there. <That's> <laughs> but the art. <laughs> um, you know, like I said earlier, I, I don't really know how it's working, but I think that very early on, um, I understood that if I could just affect one person, just one person, that's already a great step. I think that the first step is to start from within. Um, if you can grow and develop um, you know, your ideas, your education, your heart, um, that's step one. If you can pull in someone else into that love fest, that's step two. Um, and if you can reach out to your community, you've already done a great job. Um, I think it's important to have realistic expectations. How do you feel about that? How do I you think, feel? yes, I concur. It's about me changing me. So witnessing without power is the most important thing. So using this topic of me, people say, well, I don't want to go in a slaughterhouse. There's nothing I can do about it. See, but it's really, you don't want to witness without power, and that's our problem. You know, unless we have power to change something, then we don't want to play. And so I figured that out. Um, it's about changing me, and then what my fears are, and then sharing the work with someone, sharing it with someone else. It's nothing I can say to you that will change you. There's nothing. But if you hear something 10 times, you can be changed. So that's a little speck of something. And as far as I'm sure the work that you both create, there's, it's going to alienate some of the audience, right? It's going to alienate some no. of the people that observe it. No. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> What's wrong with men in string bikinis? <laughs> And is that a concern? Is it, you know, when you're trying to make a change, is it, is it a concern about alienating audience? Some people learn by being adversarial. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sonia and I were just discussing, like, I'm vegan. Um, and just by saying to people, oh, I'm sorry, I can't eat that flesh, you know, I'm very polite sometimes. Um, <laughs> starts people being defensive and they can be quite adversarial and that's how people learn. Mm -hmm. So any questions or feeling, you, we can bounce them back and forth. That's culture. Mm -hmm. Culture's not about silence, it's about sharing and debating. I also think that with a lot of, um, especially with the contemporary art world, um, nothing is complete without dialogue. and. Um, once you can start talking, you start the debate, I think that's already the, the first step, sharing the idea behind the work. Um, you know, so the more you talk about it, I think the more you explore ideas, and then you may see it then in, in, in a different way. It's, it might be alienation in the beginning, but uh, that's just the first layer. And with dialogue, it, it, it could be completely turned around. Yeah. You know, art doesn't happen until the viewer makes it happen. Mm -hmm. Like, I can think, God, I'm a genius, maybe. But it doesn't work until you, the viewer, are gazing at the work and you see something in it. And then art happens. That's what you just said. You know, you've both um, brought up different aspects of your life and your background. Was there one moment in particular that was just pivotal that happened to you? Uh, was it the, that moment of hearing the, the crying of the animals next to the, where you lived as a young girl? Or Zaina, was it being in New York in 9-11? Were, were those the moments that all of a sudden shifted the art that you make? Um, I mean, 9-11 was definitely a, a shift, but to be honest, it, the shift wasn't enough until I experienced the problem firsthand back home. The day you hear your first bomb drop, um, you, can't, you can't go back. You know, um, the sound and the feeling and um, 
the texture of the emotion is uh, that after that point, I, I knew that um, there's, there's no way I could ever deny you know, the part of the world that I live in and mm -hmm. the violence that comes with it. Well, we spoke about traumatizing, and I think part of the path of being an artist is redrawing the trauma of having acid thrown on your brain. Mm -hmm. And when you do art, you're re-traumatizing the viewer. And tactically, I think it's a mistake for any social justice movement to assume other people have the same emotional response. Mm -hmm. I mean, 90% of you here don't care about animals, don't, aren't interested in animals, can respect my interest, but my crying or emotional is not gonna resonate with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake tactically in a social justice movement. Um, what we need to do in all these themes we're bringing up is make the issue, politicize the issue, put it into the realm of, make the so social justice movement part of the political realm. So I've used the example of smoking. I used to love smoking. I adore smoking. And I can't smoke here. That's so sad for me. And I have to get over it. And that's how eating meat will be. So that's where the law has changed behavior because it's a political issue. And that will be someday very soon how eating meat will be. You cannot starve the rest of the world because you want the taste of animal flesh. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get too on that point, but that's where you get it out of the emotional mm -hmm. witnessing and into the public. Did I make that clear? Mm -hmm. There's so much jet lag <laughs> involved with the brain cells have died off like billions of You said something really interesting yesterday. You said that you will remember the taste, the smell, you will miss it, mm -hmm. but you will, um, you will not be able right. you know, to consume it. And yes. you, I think you said something also very interesting about technology. Um, what about was it? Growing. <laughs> 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 that we now have the technology to grow meat from cells that we wouldn't have to uh, um, kill animals. Yeah, that could be grown in a lab. It can be a veal chicken cell, it's just amino acids, it's just chemistry, our bodies are just chemistry. We don't have to fall in love with the fantasy. All our food now is franken food. There is no natural, we, you should have seen the sheep this morning. Guess where they come from? Australia, unconverted tankers. Do you think that's natural? No. <laughs> Do you think sheep are natural in Australia? No. They got there because they were the, um, objects of the affection of the sailors. So they, did I put that in a sensitively <laughs> cultural way? <laughs> um, <laughs> because when they took the prisoners over to Australia, it took like half a lifetime to get there. And if one had an affectionate relationship with someone of the same gender, that would have been the death penalty in the British Navy. Ergo, the sheep. The sheep got to Australia for that purpose. Is that natural? No. Is that part of culture? No. So I think we can make the next step and grow sheep cells in a lab because it's just as up as prisoners on some mutiny on the bounty boat going to Sydney. That's what you meant me to say. Yes. That's exactly <laughs> the point you were talking about, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With all the problems in the world and all the issues that we hear about and see, see every day, how do you choose the issues that you're going to involve yourselves with? Is it intuition? Is it go back, does it go back to something in your life that touches that memory and that's, that's the issues that you choose? Or how do you, how do you choose which issues to to create work around? It's a great question. I, I think they choose me. Mm -hmm. um, I have this open channel with the world, and it comes from the basic belief that there is no separation between art and life. Um, so everything is art, every moment, every thought, every idea, every action. And then some just stand out more, more than others. And then some will can hibernate for a while and re-manifest you know, later on in, in time in 
different mediums. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's about keeping an open channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say exactly that. That's exactly. Sometimes you see something and it hibernates in your mind and it might co not come back for 20 years. And if it's still there itching away, it needs to be spoken about, it needs to come out. So it is about openness and it is about allowing the content to choose you. And is memoir, is the memoir genre a form of activism, do you feel? Oh yeah, yeah. especially um, being an Arab woman, I really believe that the more transparent I can be, the better and stronger my work. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we're living in very, very interesting times and things are changing um, so quickly. And I think that if you can put yourself out there and be completely um, open, you will have a better uh, chance to meet other people, like-minded or even not. Um, and this can start a dialogue in, in so many ways. It, it, it's oftentimes very uncomfortable given our cultural um, you know, backgrounds and social, um, socially imposed limitations. Um, but this is my life's purpose and my journey. And um, you know, everyone, everyone has their problems to deal with and their, their issues and challenges. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, I think that the more honest you are, then the better the work will be. Truth is beauty. That's good. <laughs> it's not beauty is truth. That's exactly right. Good. <laughs> is it cathartic for you to, to create this work for yeah. both of you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't know so how you do it. So much of the work is about the technique. Technique is a test of sincerity. Mhm. Mm so, um, Saina said something last night and today that she puts the thousands of pins in. Mm -hmm. That's the test of sincerity, that she's asking you to look at her labor. And if you've got labor in the work, people trust that you cared about this enough to um, make it good for people to look at. Um, so. Yes, technique mm -hmm. is a test of, uh, Ezra Pound said that, so just scrap the Ezra Pound part, <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. Oh, cool. Thank you for coming. This has been delightful. I love both of your art. I have a, a question for both of you, and, and perhaps they're both fluffy, but I, for Zaina, I, I question, um, what do you hope for with the, the millennial generation coming out of Lebanon, or coming out of Beirut? And Sue, I'm interested in your response to the um, horse meat scandal that spread throughout Western Europe, especially how it was treated in the UK, where there's a food taboo on horse meat. Um, I would say to the next generation of Lebanese, um, party less, work more, and don't fool yourselves. We often parade around the Middle East saying, Wallah, we're the most open country, blah, 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 because, well, our women can wear bikinis and dance around, but you know what? our women don't have the right to pass off nationality. This means I don't exist as a woman in my own country. Just to break it down to you, if I married a man who wasn't Lebanese and we had a kid, my child, even though we live in Lebanon, my work is all about Lebanon, I'm trying to do good things for my country, my child, would not be Lebanese. Let's not kid ourselves anymore. Bikinis are fine, but let's really start talking to our politicians, throw away the curtains, and really get our hands dirty and start working. Enough sky bar. <laughs> <laughs> you partied Sorry. a lot, though, in the past. Yes, I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, people are now eating ponies, and they're heartbroken. It's okay to eat. You know, I mean, this is a splitting thing. Suddenly, it's flicker in your burger. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And uh, it was so predominant. It was, oh, they've just shoved this in. That's what I mean, it's franken food. And I think one of the very best things that came out of that is the federal government of America was all ready to bring back horse slaughter in the United States. And one judge said, no, we're not doing that because we struggled to get horse slaughter banned. And when they slaughter horses in the United States, they're police horses, they're people's pets, um, the meat goes for a lot of money. They brand S into the body of the living animal. Um, so the judge, this is why mass education works. The judge is affected by you. The judge is affected by activism and the judge said no. And so that's on every level of activism, meat consumption is going down. Um, we needn't talk about welfare anymore. We need to up it to talk about abolition. Welfare was fine 20 years ago. It's not fine anymore. The equivalent welfare, just quickly, if I had a huge club and I was beating you to death with it, and then someone else rushes in and says, oh no, that's cruel, here's a smaller club to beat you to death with it. That's welfare. We don't want any beating to death with clubs. That's over. So in terms of the horse slaughter, there's so much good going on. Meat consumption is dropping in America for so many reasons. Um, activism does work, does work. We've seen that over and over. You know, the corporate classes want us to feel hopeless. It's part of the line, right? And I want to know what the plot of the shutdown is because there's a plot. I just don't have the story to it. But there's something going on with that. Not that they're capable of plotting in an advanced way, but there's something about making a profit with this I can't quite get. We don't have the plot of what's going on, but there is a plot, and the plot is to make some maximum amount of money. Hi, um, I'm Jade. It's an honor to have you both here. Um, I was wondering if you could both speak a little bit about your choice of medium and why you felt this was the best medium to express the ideas that you intended to. Oh, I think you should get this one, because I, I talked all about plastic. Didn't you yeah, just said it. one word? It's plastic. plastic. That's not <laughs> talking all about it. That's an interesting question. I think you have more Do you want me to get away to with say. this? I'll make it go away. Look. <laughs> yeah. Come on, you say. I want to know more about your I lithography. I went into whole Obama <laughs> thing. Go, oh, you do. All right, I'll, I'll be really brief. But yeah, I think that the materials should kind of represent what the work is, is about. Um, for me, I'm comfortable working with, you know, different different things. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, though, I'm not drawing as much as I used to. Um, and yeah, I just I feel like the medium, you know, tells the message. And uh, like I said, a lot of the stuff I get is from the the world around me, and I just take it in and throw it back on onto the canvas. Because I think that it's um, the material itself is also honoring uh, the time and space of of the work. Um, I'd like to start drawing, though. She's trying to get me to yeah. to go back to Print drawing. Icon. Yeah. When you paint, do you listen to music? And if you listen to music, what kind of music do you listen to? Oh, that's a that's a tricky question for us. You were saying music make you didn't I like the emotional music. aspect yeah. of music. I don't want it around <laughs> me ever, and I've never had it around me. It's too emotional. I don't like it. Mm. You I'm the opposite. Like <laughs> I have the music on really, really loud. Also, because particularly with me, as I'm working with the pins, I, I really do go into this meditative state, and you know, I, I this finger has no feeling anymore, <laughs> and <laughs> and just. Um, but I don't listen to, you know, like beautiful spiritual music. I like, I'm not like, ah. <laughs> no, um, but I don't really listen to angry music either. I have to admit that sometimes there is a bit of Shakira that comes through, you know. Um, but I also, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, the local scene in, in Beirut. I love, 
everyone from Ziad Rahbani to Mashra Leila, big fans of all of them. Um, and yeah, the 80s creep in every now and then, and the Iron Maiden will come back from time to time. <laughs> no, I have the BBC on Al Jazeera. I want talking plots, mm -hmm. no high notes, no sobbing, no crying, no music. <laughs> I want news, <laughs> news, news, news. It's soothing the thought of world catastrophe. <laughs> <It's just laughs> Thank you Thank both. You. On, on that one more, I'm, I am a big fan of music. One day I, I did actually get in touch with one of my favorite musicians, Amanda Palmer. And uh, she actually did write back and we started a dialogue um, because her music really, I, at one point in my life when I was feeling very down, um, it really empowered me and it just pulled me back together. She's a strong, powerful woman. Um, and I told her this and we started talking and now we're actually working together. Um, we've collaborated on a sculpture that's similar to the Allah one, but it's, it's actually a, a fist. And she had, um, so I wanted to do symbols of revolution. So we started with the, the fist and she had this idea to put a hole in here where we could put fresh flowers every day. So it's, you know, having this life that's always part of, of the sculpture too. And that's, that's been like uh, a, a musical art highlight, right? Yeah. Zaina, thank yeah. you thank for you. coming. Yeah. Sue as yeah. well, thank you so much for coming, Alba <laughs> And thank you for coming.